Welcome to the Red Bull Theater Podcast, where guests discuss all things classical theater with your host, Nathan Winkelstein. Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight. This evening's conversation will focus on one of Shakespeare's most beloved characters, and at least of his own opinion, probably the best actor in Shakespeare's canon. This is, of course, Bottom the Weaver from Midsummer Night's Dream. Our guest tonight has just recently finished playing this role in the stunning Folger production at the National Building Museum. New York stage audiences will know him from his star turns in Red Bull's The Alchemist, for which he received a Lotel nomination, and Shakespeare in the Park's Merry Wives of Windsor. He has also performed in a myriad of other Broadway, off-Broadway productions, as well as many TV shows and films. It's too many to mention. Otherwise, I won't have any time to chat with him. He is, of course, the great Jacob Ming Trent. Oh. Hey, Jacob. Hey, man. How's it hey. going? Good, good. Thank you for uh, thank you for agreeing to hop on so close to Thanksgiving. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm excited to be here, brother. Yeah, well, I'm excited to have you. It's It, it truly is a pleasure. The uh, you're going to start as we start with all of these things. You're going to uh, read a little bit of the text for us that we'll use as a jumping off point. And because I'm sure so many of the people who are watching this have no idea what happens in Midsummer Night's Dream, I'm just going to give them a little bit of um, context for what's about to happen, and then I'll leave it to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, um, the scene you're about to see is when Bottom the Weaver, Coombe Star stage performer, has just had a bit of a wild experience in the woods, uh, an experience that included having his head turned into an ass head, becoming the lover of the Queen of Fairies, and generally frittering away his time with said fairies. He now awakens and is left to wonder if this was all a dream. When my cue comes, call me and I will answer. My next is most fair Pyramus. What ho, Peter Quince? Flute the bellows mender. Snout the tinker. Starveling? Regards my life stolen hence and left me asleep. Hmm. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. We thought I was, no man could say what. We thought I was, and we thought I had, Mm, the man is but a pat's fool if he were offered to say what we thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, nor his tongue conceive, nor his heart report what my dream was. I'll have Peter Quince write a ballad of this dream, and it shall be called, no, 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 it shall be called Bottom's Dream, cause it ain't got no bottom. <laughs> and I will sing it at the latter end of the play, to make it more gracious, I'll sing it at her death. Mm. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a blast. I always like to start kind of at the beginning with these things. Bottom's one of these roles, right? He's an iconic role. If you're a Shakespeare guy who's known for being funny, you know probably at some point you're going to be asked to do this guy, to play this guy. Right. So when you got the call to to play this role and when you decided to do it, what what is the first thing that you do 
when you go, okay, here we go with this, with this role, how do you approach it to make sure that it is yours? Well, the first thing is, is um, what are the given circumstances? And we, with Bottom, he has a potential of getting six pence a day. Now, folks, I'll be honest with you. Um, Nathan probably knows what that is, six pence a day, because he studies these things. I don't know what six pence a day would mean <laughs> in today's time. But I think about myself as an actor. Somebody said to me, Jacob, if you nail this Broadway show, you will receive each day a certain amount of money for the rest of your life. Well, then I'm going to kill it. I'm going to go all in, right? I mean, I do that anyway. That's my brand. I mean, I'm going to give you 110%, but I'm going to nail this. And that's what leads to bottom saying, no, 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 no. Let me play the lion too. It's not because he's just being an ass or, you know, his ego is because he needs this money. So the more roles he can play, the better, right? All comedy starts with this serious, take it that serious, I promise you, it'll be funny. Well, let's, uh, actually, can you, that that gets right into sort of another question I had. Mm -hmm. the, the, well, okay, so, so yes, I, I mean, the, the worst thing that any, any person playing a funny role can do is go, cool, my job is to be funny. Um, yeah. That's it. So we start with the truth of the character mm -hmm. and then but but i i do think and and please push back if you disagree that then once you have that especially in shakespeare mm -hmm. there then is sort of this this almost comedic math that does have to be landed Oh, right, yeah. where it's like, it's like, okay, Quince throws me this ball and I knock it down. And then Snout throws me this ball and I knock that one down. And, you know, and we're, we're, and then I toss the ball up for them. How do you marry the truthfulness of your given circumstances with also having to be sort of aware of just the math of how comedy would work? How do you, yeah. how do you make both of those work together? Absolutely. Well, like we just already discovered, comedy is serious, right? But then also there is a level of precision to it always. And so when you're, I mean, I actually think they're both one and the same. The seriousness with which I approach nailing those beats and how mathematic it really is at the end of the day is also the seriousness with which bottom approaches it, right? These things kind of blend and go together. That's what makes this role so interesting. It's kind of meta for the actor. I realized when I was in it that you have to, one of the things I first discovered when we were first in rehearsals, all the mechanicals, including myself, I'm a mechanical, but the, the fellows, people playing flute and all those guys, they were looking to me. Well, Jacob, do what you do. You're funny. Go. Or what do you want to do here, Jacob? The same way they were treating bottom, right? Right. Jacob, you've been the lead in Shakespeare in the Park. You've been a regular on HBO. You have the answers. And so we had a meeting. I pulled them aside and said, this will not be good if you guys are constantly looking to me. We have to work as a team. We have to work as a unit. Why do I bring that up? That's what Bottom learns in the play, that it's not just about him. That's why, so we start with that speech. That's what that speech, some of what that speech is about, that there's more to this world. There's more going on here than I thought. It's not just about me. It's bigger than me, right? And that's what leads, that's what leads us there. So it's funny that you bring these things up, the seriousness, which with the actor has to approach it if it's gonna be successful, mat mer matches the seriousness with which the actor has to attack these comedic beats, this math that you call it. But then, you know, I think really what you're getting at is you have to also throw in who you are, what you are. You know, for instance, uh, the lion joke. Um, uh, let me play the lion too. I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you as twer any nightingale, right? Or he says, um, um, let me play the lion. I will, I will roar you that I will do the Duke's, uh, I will, oh, I forget how it goes though. 
but they they first yell at you. They say you're going to do it too terribly. You and then you adjust to saying how mild it'll be. Yes, I talk about how mild it'll be, and I say I'll roar you that the Duke will say, "Let him roar again." That's it. Right, and then I change the line. So I roar you that the Duke will say, "Let him roar again. Let that fat black man roar again." You know, just to bring a little bit of myself in there. Do you? think you and you did it a little bit in this speech and we'll get to this speech I just don't think one can ever really talk about it out of context I think we need to understand the the role um even in this speech you you played with with the language and Mm. do you um how do you make the choice of what to play with and is it a choice that is affected by um what am I trying to ask Bottom rarely speaks in verse, right? Right. Uh, he he does when he's he speaks in kind of dog role when he's playing Pyramus, but he's a, he's a prose character. He's a clown, right. and and we know um, to to get the scholarship in there, right? Like we <laughs> actually know that Shakespeare's biggest problem with the actor who played Bottom was that he, Will Kemp would go off script whenever he wanted because he was a clown and he knew how to make the audiences laugh, and Shakespeare wanted him to stay on the freaking line. Um, so how do you how do you take into consideration like that level of this is the script I have, but also this is the spirit of the role and of this production and and how how do you how do you marry that? Well, truthfully, what you just said was my, one of my interests into this. You have to look at the, what is the relationship of the clown to the text, and how did these roles come about? What is the spirit of that? Right. And so these clowns are rebellious. Right. So I tend to be when I'm playing the clowns, I tend to be more rebellious for sure, because I want to be in that spirit. Um, And it drives certain people nuts. You know, they're like Shakespeare's, you know, there's Jesus and then there's Shakespeare. Um, And so I want to be rebellious with that. Also, I take into account where I am. What city am I in? Who's in the audience? How do I connect with these folks? How do I make these folks laugh? How do I get these folks to lean forward? And so when I was doing Cymbeline or Richard II, no, I didn't change the text at all. It didn't warrant it. It didn't merit it. It doesn't feel right. But in these plays, I know it's what would have happened. I also know that in the play within the play, Shakespeare's making fun of Ken, right? So... Because we know Shakespeare doesn't write like that. So we go, is Kemp adding these alax, alax, alax? You know, is that what's happening? So, yeah, I'm constantly trying to really get that clown spirit, that rebellious spirit into the role. And also, um, it keeps me on my toes. It keeps my fellow actors on my toes. The audience, it, they, they lean in a little bit more, I find. Yeah, if, if if you just if you surprise them, basically, you don't let them go into their their rote. Yeah. Yes. How do you find that? What is it like in the room? Is it a negotiation in the room with mm. your fellow actors and your directors? Because I, I like like so many things, I could imagine that a certain level of improv would would quickly become chaotic in terms of like, yo, we need. We need to cue a light on that line, <laughs> right? Like there's, and then, but then also, we one needs that because I I fully agree with you, especially about this role that it needs that spirit of let 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 this actor roar, um, yes, right. <laughs> is, um, so so what, I'm just curious because I think probably a lot of people who who are watching this have have a lot of experience observing and watching and reading Shakespeare, but in terms of the the process of examining and even slightly exploding a role inside a room what it what what did you find that to be like well what i say first is if you could imagine going back and seeing these plays the actors would have done that from time to time they would have got inspired and said oh vengeance and there was no oh vengeance in the script right so that would have happened um second of all yes Technically, I don't add lines at the end of my lines too often. It's always usually technically in the middle. 
Um, you're making me give away my secrets. I like for people to come <laughs> up, up there just winging it, you know. But uh, so it's always in the middle. If it's at the end, they're, they're you know, I'm more ginger with that. Normally, now the stage managers I've worked with were excellent stage managers. They pick up the rhythm of what I'm doing, surprisingly. That's another key. I'm not outside of the rhythm of the text, right? I'm not actually breaking the show. Right. Okay. So if I say something in rehearsal that's an improv and it feels like something broke or something stopped or you feel like a clunk, 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 that's not a good thing. If I say something and it, everything keeps flowing, then I know that it, 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 it might work. Again, uh, most times I don't do this. Um, but as I'm growing with the work and as I'm discovering the work, I'm in a period now where you know, I do Shakespeare because I want to do something for the community. I want to bring people together. I want to spark a conversation, right? Um, and sometimes I feel like the best way to do that is to kind of thumb my nose a little bit. You know what I mean? To kind of ruffle a few feathers a little bit. I think sometimes we play it too safe with this writer. I mean, look, we're going to do Midsummer Night's Dream a million times. You know, when they're traveling through space and going to Mars or going to some distant whatever, they're going to be reading Shakespeare, I promise you. Right? They might even be performing Shakespeare, I promise you. So we have, we're going to do this so much. Why do we have so much reverence? Why do we hold on to the rules? Why do we shackle ourselves? Right? So, yeah. Well, uh, uh, okay. Why? So... Sometimes when I hear those sentiments, mm -hmm. I hear those sentiments from people who are saying, why, why do Shakespeare at all? Which mm. is, does not seem at all to be what you're saying. You mm -hmm. seem to be saying that in some ways you prefer to do Shakespeare to engage with the community. So what, why, why are you interested in thumbing your nose at <laughs> Shakespeare as opposed to dismissing him? What, right. what, 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 yeah, what what intrigues you about that act, about doing it inside it, as opposed to just going away from it? Right. You know, when I was, I've been doing this right since 11 or 12 years old, and, and when I was first introduced to it, it was very much, I was introduced to the rules. I was introduced to Gil Good. I was introduced to Ian McKellen and all these wonderful men, uh, you know. Got to breathe at the end of the line. Right. right. Every line. Every line. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I enjoyed watching them. I really did. And I tried to be them. Right. So I went to school, got my master's, and I was trying to, how do I get closer to these guys? And then one day I woke up and I was playing opposite F. Murray, actually. We were doing Merchant of Venice. And I realized I was never going to be anything close to them, to, to Ian McKellen, Gilgood, Lawrence Olivier. Uh, and they were never going to try to be me either. But, but in that thought, I learned what is closest to me? What is my instrument saying? And I realized what my instrument was saying, just like they were calling on their relatives and the people they grew up with, I started calling on the people I grew up with, my relatives, and started bringing them to the stage. And then when I started doing that, people would respond. People would respond. I'd be at the Delacorte and, and, and there would be different folks of people responding to this and another joke, different folks of people are responding to. And I realized that when they saw what was genuine in me with this writer, that they would respond genuinely. And I love that. And I figured, you know, even in today, and I write about this a lot, you know, we live in an age where, you know, we see the all- Asian play, we see the all black play, all this culture, all that culture. And that's fine. That's beautiful. I appreciate those things. But classical work for me is a place where we can come together at this point in time. And that's what makes it useful to me. So we can come together. People can bring their all their backgrounds, all their, their baggage, if you will. And we can throw it all into the pot and see what happens. And so that's why I think classical work is important. I think Shakespeare is important for now. There may be a day where we go, mm, not anymore, but for now, I think it's still useful. And you, I, I, I'm just sort of, I'm fascinated by this. And you think 
Because on the one hand, you you like to explode Shakespeare and not take him too loyally. But also there seems to be a feeling that you can find inside this work characters and human beings that speak to you if, if, if we allow ourselves and if we remove ourselves from feeling like we must follow exactly in the footsteps rather than stand on the shoulders of people mm -hmm. who have come before. Mm -hmm. right? And so... I guess I find that, I guess I'm just trying to clarify what you're saying because I find it very um, optimistic. I like it. <laughs> I, I am optimistic. You know, look, we, we, we have to, what we have to, in my opinion, what we have to stop doing is when somebody walks in the room and delivers a speech, if they're not, if they don't fit into our idea of how this should be done, we have to stop dismissing them. Right. One of, you know, every everyone on this planet has a right to contribute a verse. And really what we should be doing is trying to find, especially with this work, trying to find more ways to include more folks. Right. Yeah. More folks. And so um, the question is, how do we do that? I don't have all the answers and and, and nor does anybody else. But to, but I also think Midsummer Night's Dream is talking about that. Yeah, I do. I think these rude mechanicals, right? They're not professional actors, but they don't even have any real props, really. They've got, we need a wall. A guy says, I'll be a wall. We'll make a wall. You're going to, we need a moon. You're going to be the moon. That's the most essential. That's the purity of theater, right? We don't have it. We'll make it ourselves. And you're really a weaver and you're really a tinker, but, but deep, but really you're an artist. And in a play about love, maybe the most important love that comes out in the play is this love for creating. You know, this love for making art. Okay, that <laughs> that's great. That's the end of podcast. Um, I wish you had said that in half an hour. It would be a perfect way to finish it. We'll just clip it. Um, the so so bottom. Mm -hmm. You you said something earlier about his his growth, his arc through the show, sort of learning that he needs a team. Um, what, how, let's talk about his arc for a second. <laughs> it's a weird one. Um, mm -hmm. Like we, I, I think that the, I, I really like what you say about how he's not just a kind of a bloviating idiot at the top, which is how he's mm -hmm. often played. He's driving towards this thing. Yes. Um, and, and as often it feels like almost being protective of his fellow actor, right? Like he's not taking the lion role from someone who wants it. He's taking the lion role from someone who doesn't want it, who's terrified of it. So he's right. a little bit overprotective maybe, a little overbearing, but he's not a jerk. He, he never no. seems like a jerk. And then, and then, um, and then a donkey head appears <laughs> and, then, and he meets the queen of fairies and he goes on this journey and then he has a, he talks about it. What, where, where did your bottom, can you just take me through like what happened to your bottom through, let's call it the dream sequence. Cause, cause he doesn't, he responds oddly to Titania. Right. Like he doesn't, this gorgeous, all powerful woman shows up and goes, let's make babies and he wants to eat peas and he sort of, he's interested in different things. And he's, he plays with the fairies almost more than he plays with Titania. And he just seems to have an odd reaction to what hits him. And I'm curious what you made of it. What was your path through the dream? You know, our, our version was cut down so much, but w one of the things that I, we did do is in, in the, in the dream, in the vision was that we played up on his, you know, bring me the honey sack and scratch my back. And in fact, this ass head makes him even more of what he was in a way, right? He's, he's bring me this and bring me that, scratch my back. And, and he has this, right, he has this beautiful spirit who wants him, but he's almost so interested in himself that he's not even worried about her <laughs> in, in, in some way. Um, it, it, the, the ass head makes him, take to be literal, an ass. At least in our version, that's what, that's what we yeah. do. 
because uh, we cut so much into it, Wh which was which leading up to this speech that we've been talking about was great because it, it, it just kept ballooning. This personality of his kept ballooning and getting even more ridiculous until he wakes. And it, it, the waking moment is really important because he's alone. Okay, so remember, this guy is a very popular guy, right? They always want to know where he is. And you see that in the next scene where they're crying when they don't have him. So that's how they feel about him. But he's alone. And, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but I did bring this up to, in the room. I said, it's not unlike Jesus when at the Garden of Gethsemane, when all the apostles are, you know, they're not with him. And in bottom, this is, you know, his moment, he's saying, will none of you wait with me? You know, Peter, John, James, you know. <laughs> but it's oh, like, the Andrew Lloyd Webber Bible. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're not there, you know, and he's, a, he's alone, which is a really important moment. And in that alone, in that silence, where he doesn't have anyone to perform for, and he's by himself, he starts to think. And this vision comes back to him, right? Is it the only time he's alone in the play? I think it is. The way we did it, where, where else might he be? He, I mean, he shows up late in the first scene. Oh, uh, no, he's alone. Well, I guess Puck is kind of, Puck scared. He's alone when he's got the donkey when head on and he starts singing. singing before Titania wakes. He's yeah. sort of alone. Titania's there. But but this is the only time he's alone in a, in a space to contemplate. In right. that moment, he's busy trying to figure out what the heck's going on. <laughs> yeah. In a he, different he, way. He's yeah. ass head free and there. So and then he has this vision. So for, for I, I have to say, just because I am a nerd, it's, it's actually nice that you think that this moment's biblical because the speech has that biblical reference. The eye of man hath not heard is all uh, the... St. Paul's, or, or is all the Paul's letter to the Corinthians joke, which the, the audience back then would have known, right? The audience would have known that he was kind of doing this almost biblical thing in that moment. And that, um, in fact, the, the Bibles of the time, uh, that, that phrase ends with um, finding the, uh, the bottom of God's, desire for us is sort of how that speech ends in the same spot in his where bottom screen it doesn't matter um it, it's a fun it's a fun thing that that audience would have gotten and laughed yes about um and it is a biblical moment um but it, it's, i, I, I want to go back so if he has become more of an ass mm -hmm. during the dream sequence he he's basically kind of gotten the absolute power corrupts absolutely thing right like he's gotten everything right and then he wakes up and he's alone and he, are you saying he rejects it? Like, no, I think what comes, well, what comes to his mind is that he calls it a vision and a dream. And he can't really, for the first time that we've seen him, he's, he, he lacks the words to express what he saw. So that I think catches him off guard. It, it, that's why the word vision, I think, is important. It doesn't start with dream. He starts with vision, which I think is different. Um, and he starts to go on to explain what he has, but he can't. Let me get to that eye of man. But I also think what's interesting about the eye of man have not heard, the ear of man have not seen, is that the eye and the ear are very close to each other. And yet they're having two different experiences. And that's Bottom's experience of the spiritual world. It's right here. And yet... I can't see it, but I know it's there because I've had this vision. So now the world, the universe, there's, there's more to this than I ever imagined there would be. I'm smaller than I thought I was. And that's what makes him a better actor. I actually think two things we did when he says, I'll sing it at the latter end of the play we actually sang a lot of the play within the play. Okay. Yeah. We turned it into yeah. like a little bit of a gospel revival. <laughs> so we actually ended up singing a lot of that. Um, and the other th line I think is very interesting that a lot of people don't take advantage of is I was singing uh, bottoms dream because it hath no bottom. 
And I think a lot of people don't take advantage of the idea that the play on the word bottom and the idea that his dream, even though bottomless, is bottomless. Right. That it's not about him. Oh, you know, uh, okay. I actually had that's a, that's a very good point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so, I uh, yeah, it's like the Bay of Portugal. Uh, yeah. Well, um, the yeah. So he he see. So he sees he sort of has a dream of this thing that he can't quite grasp, no. and that has made him feel small in retrospect because he was so large. He was you know equal to the Queen of Fairies for a moment, and is now just bottom the Weaver again. Exactly. Um, exactly. And yeah, and then he decides, it is interesting going back to the biblical thing of like the revelation that happens in, in the Corinthians. Bottom has a revelation. Yes, bottom, um, the old bottom is dead. Right. And he's reborn. And he wants to do it in theater. Yeah. He wants, he wants to explore what he's found out in theater. That's that's right. And look, and listen, you know, these are th people who listen to this. These are things we never say outside of the room because people would think we were ridiculous. <laughs> but, you know, well, let's say the bottom is Jesus in some way. But, but, okay. So when he gets to the next scene and he sees he's there and, and what we did is I watched them. And I, our show was very musical. So they were singing, they had a harmonica. They were singing the blues about bottom being gone. But that moment where bottom says enough of me, or um, it's, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, another line. No more says, breath or... Yeah, it's yeah. not about me, he says. Enough of me. Let's not talk about me. The Duke have dined. Then he starts talking about his, you do this, and your beard, and make sure you know your lines, and this. You see him actively saying, it's not about me, let's talk about you. Right? It's in the text. And that's a change. That's a direct change from the first from the first time we see them. Right, and he's not trying to play every role now. Mm -mm. He's actually saying to them, "Yeah, you look to your beard. Do you know your lines? Look, every man be ready. Play your roles. He's not saying, look, I, was, I almost slept with the fairy queen, so everybody back off. I'll take what I want. No, 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 no. <laughs> right, and then also in, <laughs> then in the play within the play, <laughs> I mean, it has always struck me. He he agrees. He agrees. Yeah, exactly. with the My dog is like absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, the uh, in, in the play within the play, he is the guy who holds it all together because that play within the play goes terribly, terribly wrong. And yeah. it's it's like bottom is like hey 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 hey. He's like juggling with everybody, but he's not juggling. He's not trying to play every role. He's trying to help everybody get through it. Um, yes, and he's, he's, he's he has actually, to hold this together. Yeah, and that was something that came up when I directed it a few years ago, was how much, like, okay, something just broke. Who's around to fix it? It's only Bottom. Bottom, everyone else is panicking or doing something else. It's always only Bottom who's available to fix things, which yeah, is We played that up. We played yeah. that up very much in the play within the play. And the, another key to this is that Bottom has to have a moment within the play within the play. This also, look, all this works with the comedy. But he has to have a, a he has to have a moment in the play within the play where his acting elevates, mm -hmm. where he gets better in front of the audience. They want to they have to see that journey, and and this is one of the things we found that I thought was wonderful because it was very funny. Then when he discovers the body, it the really he, you know he becomes this almost good actor and it's heartfelt but to watch the audience's surprise right they go what oh wow he actually is he's you know transforming and that that's there's a little bit of magic in that yeah you can land that yeah well and some people give that moment to flute Mm -hmm. You know, some people allow flute speech to really be yes, and and then I think have sometimes made the mistake mm -hmm. of having Bottom hate him for it. Yeah, Whereas, in fact, like the other way you could do it is that maybe Bottom's not capable of reaching true greatness, but he's capable of appreciating it. Yes, is that, that like if flute slays, 
bottom could also could also love that right he loves theater absolutely um, yeah absolutely and then i mean depending on how you do it the duke comes out and he says you know he makes a uh, depending no, a, a joke about uh hanging performers yep. yeah for when the players are all dead they, they need no excuse right yeah. and what do they talk about the whole time they talk about making mistakes and being hung right to fright the duke that we that you know um how, how did that how did you play that how do you how do you deal with that moment it's a weird moment actually very, in the play it's a struggle um because it comes out of this farce and then there's like this line that theseus drops and then he's like i'm just I'm just messing with you yeah. he's like what um it's a weird strange flex and they, of the, power. The problem, a lot of problems with these plays is that there are so many things baked into them that aren't in the text you know, we, 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 we take certain things for granted. If we begin this play with a level of seriousness, not only is it funnier, the stakes are higher. So then you get these laughs and then you can turn the audience on a dime and have them go, yeah. ooh. But the problem is when we start too light at the top. There's no stakes. Yeah, the first scene, the first scene of this play is not a comedy. Not at all. The first scene of the play is Hippolyta is has been kidnapped by Theseus and is being forced to marry him. Like it's none of it's good. No. Um, like yeah, no, no. I I totally agree, and I think it is it is a, an essential point that comes up over and over again. Is that is like the necessity of stakes for comedy, and that like some of the funniest playwrights out there like. Uh, I mean, he comes immediately to mind, but like Edward Albee, his, his plays are hilarious. Yeah. They're incredibly high stakes and incredibly yeah, dark. They're, they're yes. also hilarious. Um, yes. And, and that's yeah. why I was saying the first mechanical scene when Peter Quint says, you can play no part but pyramids. You know, I had to really convince the actor to go, I'm like, you got to tear into me. You know, you really have to demand that he listens at that moment because the, 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 it's hard, the stakes for the mechanicals is hard to get across to the audience because immediately now we've done this play so often, people are going, get ready to laugh, the mechanicals are coming. Yep. That we don't get the audience to listen to the sixpence thing or the fear that Snug has of playing the lion or... Uh, Peter Quint's not able to quite wrangle control and get these guys on the same page. And the problem that bottom is in getting that to happen. There are some natural rubs here when we start. And I think they're, they're, they're rehearsal room jokes. Yeah. You know, you have this star who's like, oh, I got another idea, another idea. And you're like, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's the herding cats joke. Right. The, ha, 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 ha. Um, with, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Quince is the director. Um, I sympathize with Quince. I bet, I bet no. you do. <laughs> um, but the uh, so in terms of the state, I just want to ask. My guess is you didn't deal with it. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Um, in the play, there is this the the incredible speech that Titania gives in the first interaction with Oberon, mm -hmm. where it is explicitly acknowledged that the world is mm -hmm. completely effed up right now. Like, to is a total environmental mess, right? Like, there are floods. Winter hasn't come. Like, we're in summer just because we're in summer. But, like, the and there's maybe starvation because all of the crops are dying and the animals are dying. Is Did that engage like the reality that Titania talks about there did that engage much in terms of the humans no because here's the thing you know one thing that was cut from our show oh, okay well then it probably wouldn't make well, sense when we did it with Julie we did it with Julie Taymor at theater for a new audience that was in and it was Tina Banco Tina Banco is a very good actress and it was riveting but let me say this again. This brings us back to you have to reinvestigate these plays. 
Lady, you bring up a speech that's important. The play actually, without it, the, the she's saying the world is messed up. It's out of joint. It's one of the reasons why she's holding on to the changeling boy. This, this, you know, she's talking about that. The stakes don't get much bigger. You have these lovers that have gone off into the woods, into the woods, which is Shakespeare's time. It's crazy. It's dark. It's dangerous. They don't know what they're doing, right? The, the, the world is in shambles. And what brings it back together? A play? Maybe? Maybe love. Maybe love? But yeah. Yeah, right. A play and, and a dream. Um, yeah, I, I at least am, I think, of the strong minority that... Um, that Demetrius is also unspelled at the end and mm. actually finds his love for Helena, that that's not just some fairy potion flashed on him, um, but that they, they because they actually, God forbid, learn in their dreams um, and grow. Right. Um, right. But yes, yeah, I, I mean, it is, that's a, it's a whole thing, but the like stakes that the fairies lay out right away are immense. And I've, I've often wondered if, if that, that got, if that would get drawn in from a design perspective or whatever, of what else is going on in this world of like these, these guys, one of whom, whom his name is starveling yeah. um, is you've got these guys who are desperate for six pence a day to live. Right. Desperate. Because, because every, everybody's in trouble. And, and apparently the King is busy having a, having a war with the Amazons rather than trying to feed his people. Right, right. Like, there's some reality points in this that tend to get washed. They, um, they get washed all the time because we, we, we come to this, and this is why I say to people who say they're scholars and people who I know this text and this many years, and I always come to it like I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If I'm looking at Hamlet and he's saying, you know, to be or not to be, I reinvestigate that line and those words because there may be something else there. When I was 33 and I read it, I could have heard one thing. I'm 43 now, I may hear another, right? You cannot take anything for granted. And let me tell you something. When I go to see Shakespeare and I see an actor who may be a good actor, right? Taking the speech for granted. You know this, I know this. Let me just show you my emotional range. Let me just show you my ability to call on the gods. We all sit back in our chair. Right. We all sit back in our chair. So we can't do that. Um, that's why. Yeah. Cannot do that. You bring up that speech. Such an important, such an important speech. Such an important speech. Yeah. And. So so and, and I did think it was interesting. I mean, Bottom's Dream is a speech where that's a trap. Right. Like Bottom's Dream is a trap speech because everybody goes, here's Bottom's Dream. And, you know, and it's it's actually it's. What I find most interesting about Bottom Dream as a speech is that from a pure language perspective, because he's a clown and he's confused, it's not like the jokes are that funny. No. It's not like the language is that beautiful. It doesn't have the same... It's a different trap from a to be or not to be, where you could start to go, I'm so terrified of this speech, I'll make no choices and I'll just sound pretty. That's it. But with Bottom, it's like a trap of like, I'm just going to pull a whole bunch of laughs and move on. Yes. Um, this, and I'll tell you this. Wendell Pierce told me this 25 years ago. He said the key to the role is that speech. He said it's the play within the play is funnier and more resonant if you take that speech seriously. <clears throat> and he's right. He's right. But in fact, the whole the whole you know, the whole thing, bottom from the beginning, if you start, one reviewer said this about me, there was an air of desperation to his bottom. If you start from a place that is deadly serious about what you need at the top of this play, the role will be, will have so many more um, colors to it. You, you, you won't even be able to help it. We'll have so many more coasts to it. And um, 
that's often the fault when you see it played. The actor playing it, because it's a very, what happens is you're very vulnerable out there. You realize that people are going, they want to love this character, they want to laugh. So you want to be liked. That's also another trap in this role. Well, I want my bottom to be liked. If you, you know. I, I was just going to say, I think that's a trap in, oh, I think that's an actor trap. Yes. Is that we want to be liked as actors. We're hesitant to play characters who, we're hesitant to lean into the yucky. Right. Um, but but if you if you wash that away, you don't have drama. You don't have turbulence, right? Like there needs to be. Yeah, some you need that friction. Yeah, it's the same thing with Falstaff. You, yeah, Falstaff, in my opinion, you know, not a good guy. And people would get upset with me for that. They're like, "Wait a minute, no." He's. I said, mm, "No." If you told me there was a guy doing this thing, I would say that's not a great dude. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, in the same way that. We laugh at Richard III is hilarious. Right. Richard the III, it's definitively not a good, no one's going to get mad at you for that one. Like yeah. Richard, like the, but it, it is like the characters that we most adore may be good guys, but if they're good guys, they're heavily flawed. Mm-hmm. And if they're bad guys, they tend to be really funny and really smart. Good writing. Um, good writing. Yeah. Do you, what, um, I was curious about that just because I know it's another skill set that you have. What, what is it like, um, Midsummer Night's Dream is structurally an interesting play, right? It mm-hmm. sort of has these three plates that are going at once. It has the lovers, the fairies, and the mechanicals, and they're all doing this, and then they get mixed up. And it's sort of an interesting structure of a play. How do you, as how did you playing bottom, but also with the playwright mind that you have? Did you do you find that you use your playwright mind to help you know where to fit, or do you try to turn that off and only go actor? Like, how do you deal with being a multi hyphenate when doing this kind of stuff? Well, you know, the truth is, is that um, good actors are good directors. That doesn't mean that they're directing, but they think like directors. Good actors also think like writers. You know, people forget, I have to tell my friends all the time, actors are some of the most well-read people in our society today because we have to read all year long. Um, And so understanding play structure is key. Even I'm going into a a musical now, but I'm always asking the director about the structure. Why is this here? Why is this line repeated three times? Our playwright is brilliant, so if if said three times, it's said for a reason. If you understand the play structure and why your character is needed to help tell the story, you you you're a long way to being successful. A long way to being successful. Often, I ask myself before I even enter a play, I'll, and I'll remind myself, what does the play need from me? And sometimes we'll bring up a little a, a situation that was a little that had some friction to it. The alchemist was that for me. Sitting in it, what did it need to make it work on a night to night basis? And when you were in it, it felt like it needed a little bit of punch. There was there was some nastiness from each character. Right. It felt like it needed that. It felt like it needed everyone to really reveal and say, here's who I am. Right. That's why when I took those wigs off at the end. Yeah. Also, I'm not who you think I am either. Right. Um, Because so sometimes you do it and. Sometimes when you make those choices, your worldview gets involved. Right. And. You may not share the worldview of, <laughs> not everybody involved may share your worldview, right? So it, it can lead to a little bit of a rub. But um, if you always take yourself, well, what do you think this, the play actually needs? And so that it's not about me. That also brings us back to bottom, right? Because it ain't got no, because it ain't got no bottom. So what did, what did, why did Midsummer need bottom? 
I think it needs the mechanicals because mechanicals represent a different kind of love that the playwright appreciates. Also, I think uh, Bottom, it's interesting, his journey, he elevates all the way to being equal with this queen of the fairies, right? So he's one of the few characters, him and Puck, that actually touch all the characters, all the stations, right, in that movement. Um, yeah, so I really do think the artist love, the love an artist has for what they do is why he's in there. Got it. That makes sense to me. I think we have one question from the audience that I want to toss in here. Yeah, so this is, I, I think we're, we're right around this and it, it's sort of to sum it up because I think we've danced around this question but maybe haven't answered it on the, on the nose of like, what is, so you've talked about the revelation about it not being about him. Mm -hmm. Is that, and, and is, is that, is that what you would say the primary revelation is to him in that moment of, of just kind of where he fits? Was there anything else that really changed for him? Yeah, I think the revelation, the revelation for bottom is there's more to this world than I ever dreamt there was. Right. It's, kind of bottomless, right? And that's what he's, that's what he's realizing. So it take, it, it elevates him. And this is also the writer, very good writer, is also teaching us that when you take on these roles as actors, not to make it about you, to make it about community. And at the end of the play, what do we have? We have community. We're Dance. doing the play for them. The audience is watching them watch us. Afterwards, we have a burger mask. It's about community. So what is saying, if you see it as bigger than you and you make it about the other people around you, then it will elevate you as an artist. And and that 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 not just as an artist, but as a human. As a like person. that's a that's a life lesson. Yeah. That's not that's, well, it's, 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 it's an important lesson for us, but it's also a life lesson of like I, I think that we we you know the the what the kind of American idiot sort of idea, the one who who is id centric, self centric instead of a member of the community of like learning to not be so self-centric and to be a member of the community and that that kind of the rising tide. I yes. Think. Um, that's cool. That's cool. No, it, it's a, um, yeah. And, and it is, and then there is that other thing cause he does involve, he does interact. I mean, we have to call it, I, I shouldn't even say, it. but mm. it is interesting that he's the only human who really gets to interact with the fairies. He's the only one, like he gets this, this peak. Um, which I guess is why he's able to come to the revelation he does is he and and I guess we could really dig into why does Puck choose him because mm. it's easy to make that just a joke right this guy's acting like an ass I'm gonna give him an ass head but Puck always seems a little bit smarter than he's just than that he's just making jokes so why does Puck choose this dude to be the one who pops into this other world messes with things and then pops back in a way that seems to rebalance all those plates in yeah. a way that they were off kilter. It's a very interesting question. It's a good one. What And the world, we know that the world is out of balance. That world is out of right. balance. Right. You know, I want, one other thing, it's so interesting, you know, as a writer, one of the, one writer, this good writer said, I became a better writer when I stopped trying to be a good writer. That's like an actor. That's like acting right there. Yeah. It's yes. Like... <laughs> For sure. Um, no, and it was something you said really early on, which which really we we moved past it pretty quickly. But like this idea of st stop trying to be what other what you imagine you mm. should be and just be the best you can be and work towards being a part of your community. Like you said that early on, and we we flew past it. But that was really a lovely. Yeah, and that is really the thing. Sentiment. Yeah, and that's messy. So let me not even, it's beautiful. You hear Nathan say, ah, oh, that's gorgeous. But 
It's messy. It's not easy. It's going to be messy. But you can't kick people off the island because you don't like it to be rocky, right? Right. When it gets rocky, you got to actually bring everybody in closer. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, you believe, you know, drama, drama is turbulence and turbulence is, is how we get better, right? Like we get better by rocking the boat. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jacob, this was a, a, um, even more of a joy than I was expecting it to be. We, we, um, and I was expecting it to be pretty joyful. So <laughs> this was, this was a real pleasure. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you so much. And uh, have a good, have a good night. Oh, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Red Bull Theater Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review on your favorite podcasting platform. Your support helps us to bring you more captivating conversations and insights into the world of classic theater. To stay updated on our latest activities, follow us on social media, get on our mailing list, and visit www.redbulltheater.com, where you'll find an abundance of podcasts, readings, classes, seminars, productions, and more. Your support makes all of this possible, so please consider making a tax-deductible donation on our website to help us continue bringing classical theater to contemporary audiences. Until next time, thanks, thanks, and ever thanks.